Principal of the UWI KFIL campus, Professor Yudin Barato, members of the diplomatic corps, Dr. Delal Worrell and Mrs. Monica Worrell, campus registrar, Mr. Romel Carter, campus bursa, Ms. Lisa Alleen, deans, immediate past co-director of the Confucius Institute, Mr. Francois Jackman, Dr. Paul Song, co-director of the Confucius Institute, heads of department, specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant good evening to you all. Thank you. I'm Henderson Carter, chair of the 70th anniversary planning committee here at KFL. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural Confucius Institute lecture to be delivered by former governor of the Central Bank of Barbados and veteran regional economist, Dr. Delisle Worrell. It is indeed fitting that the Confucius Institute at KFL, launched in 2015, should have an inaugural lecture. For the past three years, the Institute, under the direction of Mr. Francois Jackman and Dr. Paul Song, has expanded its program to include classes in Mandarin at the Ellerslie School and at St. Stephen's Primary. And I'm reliably informed that other schools will come on stream this semester. No wonder then the Institute won the Global Confucius Institute of the Year Award in 2017. And we congratulate the staff for this sterling service thus far. This lecture is also the first in a series of lectures in celebration of the university's 70th anniversary under the theme, 70 years of service, 70 years of leadership. Our university started on October 3rd, 1948 with 33 medical students at the Mona campus. We now have four campuses and over 40,000 students. And that is something to be grateful for and be, to be thankful for. This all year round celebration includes public lectures in Barbados and in the OECS territories, symposia, community talks, a gala dinner, heritage tours, sporting activities, and exhibitions. And I am sure that you will join us for some, if not all, of these events. Thanks tonight for gracing us with your presence as we celebrate the sterling work thus far of the Confucius Institute and the university as a whole. Again, welcome to the KFL campus. It gives me great pleasure to invite Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of the KFL campus, Professor Yudin Barto, to offer her remarks. Thank you, Chair, Dr. Henderson Carter, who is also our chair of the 70th Anniversary Committee. Members of the Diplomatic Corps, especially the distinguished members of the Embassy of the People's Republic of China, our ambassador from Japan and his wife, our guest speaker, Dr. Delai Worrell and his wife, Mrs. Monica Worrell, deans, immediate past co-director of the Confucius Institute, Mr. Francois Jackman, and his wife, who is also a diplomat representing the Guyanese Embassy, Dr. Paul Song, co-director of the Confucius Institute, heads of department, specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. 
Welcome to the Kville campus and welcome to the inaugural lecture of the Confucius Institute. As you have heard from Dr. Henderson Carter, the Confucius Institute is only three years old, but since its inception, since it started operating, it has been a very dynamic and involved aspect and entity on the Kville campus. And the way we regard the, the Confucius Institute is that it is not an exotic addition, but it is fully involved and fully immersed in the academic and cultural life of the campus. And we welcome that, and this is the way that any institute, a similar institute is started, we would want it to proceed. We are not surprised at all that the Confucius Institute would have introduced an inaugural lecture series, and we are delighted that the first speaker is in fact Dr. Deli Worrell. As we all know, Dr. Deli Worrell is an outstanding Barbadian and regional economist, and I was reminding him that at fresh out of doing my undergraduate degree, I, one of the books that I read was a book that he did on the Barbados economy in 1945 to 1980. And even before then, he has made outstanding contributions to economic analysis. So the Confucius Institute, in good vintage style of only a three-year-old institute, has started, started their ball rolling with an excellent speaker. But this morning, when I was listening to the news at 7.30, I thought, what excellent timing. Ms. Marla Dukaran from the RBC was on the, on the 7.30 News commenting on the upcoming, upcoming later in the day report that would come from the Central Bank of Barbados on the Barbadian economy. I went to a meeting and then when the meeting was over and I looked at the Nation newspaper a little later in the day, I saw the front page was a discussion on the Barbadian economy and Dr. Deli Worrell's picture was on the front of it. And I said, well, I told him earlier this evening, regardless of what you're talking about, we have the lecture on how China's economic success contributes to Caribbean prosperity. But I told him, be ready for the question and answer period, because people want to hear what you have to say about what was said today. And I feel very proud that the Confucius Institute, a lecture that had been planned over three months ago, would be delivered on a day where this is so timely, and I know that Dr. Didai Worrell can more than handle the discussions. I don't have to tell you what he was doing immediately before he was given this lecture. But the, the Confucius Institute, as you have heard, is engaged in a very vibrant program on the Cable campus. There, it, as it relates to teaching, they have started teaching Chinese language and culture to students from the, in the BSc in software engineering, which was a program that started two years ago and is like split site delivery. Students will do two years at the Cable campus in Barbados and they go on to two years in Suzhou at the Global Institute for Software Technology. And the Confucius Institute has been preparing them, the students who will go on after the first two years, for to give them conversational Chinese and an understanding of Chinese society. The Confucius Institute, very early in its inception, when it was just over a year old, also got permission from the headquarters handban to issue HSK testing, which is the only official proficiency testing that is established for proficiency in the Chinese language, and this was done very early. The Confucius Institute also has worked and is currently working with CXC to introduce a, a certificate, a CSEC certificate in Chinese language. And we think this is fantastic because it means that students at the Kville campus, well, the students who do CSEC throughout the region will be exposed. But we also think that at the Kville campus, we have a responsibility. If uh, CXC is going to issue a certificate in, in Chinese language for performers, then we have to equip teachers to teach in the language. So working with the Faculty of Humanities and Education and the Dean, Professor O'Callaghan, 
the, the, the Confucius Institute has played a critical role in developing a minor in Chinese studies that we hope to have introduced for the beginning of the academic year. So not only is there teaching on the campus assistance to CXC, the Confucius Institute also teaches Chinese language to primary and secondary schools in Barbados. One of them, Ellerslie Secondary School, St. Stephen's School, uh, Providence School, and they also offer what is called Sunday school, but is often understood very differently to the traditional Barbadian Sunday school. This is for young Barbadian Chinese born here to, to ensure that they maintain a, a love and understanding and fluency in their language. They come to the institute on Sunday and learn Mandarin. So we have, and one of the things the Confucius Institute also does, there's a competition called a bridging competition in which Barbadian students, uh, sorry, I should say Cavill students, because when you're a, a student at the Cavill campus, it doesn't matter where you come from, you're Cavill students. So Cavill students learn and demonstrate their proficiency in Chinese language and culture. But very early, I said to the co-directors, a bridge is anchored in two areas. So that just like we have Chinese uh, uh, Caribbean students understanding Chinese culture, a, 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 a true bridge, I want Chinese students to understand Barbadian and Caribbean culture. So I want them to, I, I want the program to develop where in secondary schools or universities in China, they sing a song by Rihanna or Gabby or Plastic Bag or somebody else from one of the Caribbean countries, and they read the work of George Lamin or Maze Conde or someone else, but that is a true bridge, so that there is a, a real appreciation of the cultures of the two regions. And hence why I said in my opening that we don't regard the Confucius Institute as an exotic addition to the campus. We want a real, true, understanding and appreciation, a mutual appreciation of the cultures. And happily, we have seen the reception to this. And so we are very pleased that you have come out tonight for a very stimulating lecture. And as principal of the campus, I'm very pleased with the work of our co-directors and the staff. And again, welcome and thank you for being here. Good evening. Thank you, Professor Barto. To introduce our speaker tonight, I now call on Professor Winston Moore, Head, Department of Economics, UWI, Kefil. Professor Moore. Senior Lecturer in History and Chair, Dr. Henderson Carter, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Senator to the Honorable uh, Maxine McLean, Chairman of Campus Council, Sir Paul Altman, Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal, UE Cafel Campus, Professor Eudine Barato, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Dr. Dilel Warrell and Ms. Monica Warrell, Campus Registrar, Mr. Ramal Carter, Campus Bursar, Ms. Lisa Aline, Dean's immediate past co-director of the Confucius Institute, Mr. Francois Jackman, Dr. Paul Song, co-director, Confucius Institute, heads of department, specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant good evening to you all. Now that the protocol is out of the way, <laughs> um, I could get into talking about why I'm, what I'm more specially uh, interested in. Um, I'm going to start this introduction a little bit differently. Um, Economic growth is perhaps one of the most controversial statistics that e um, economists use in their day-to-day -day practice. Uh, it essentially is the average rate of total economic growth in a particular economy. The reason why I said that is controversial is because it doesn't necessarily me uh, measure the social um, contributions made by that economy. It doesn't measure the, econ the environmental impact made by that production. It simply measures the total production in the economy. Now, looking at the statistics for economic growth between Barbados and China, um, as well as um, the Caribbean and China, you can see something really interesting. Um, over the last 10 years, the average rate of economic growth in the Caribbean was just half of a percentage point. 
the previous decade, it was almost three percentage points, and the decade before that, just under two percentage points. So for that entire period, the average rate of growth in the Caribbean has never exceeded three percentage points per year. Now, turning our attention now to China, over the last 10 years, the average rate of economic growth in China was 8%. Building on the previous decade, it was as high as 10% per year. So why do we need this lecture tonight? We need this lecture because we can leverage that economic growth that China has been experiencing over the last 10, 20 years. For academics like myself, investigating why the growth and um, the differences in economic growth between these two regions was so different is why I do what I do on a um, daily basis. It's also important to understand how we can leverage the growth um, in China to help Caribbean economies um, get up to that 8%, that 10% per year uh, um, over the next 10, 20 years in the Caribbean. Now, why is Dr. Dewalt Lau Worrell specially placed to interrogate this subject? Dr. Worrell is well placed to interrogate this subject because of his uh, special interest in small states and his wide and vast experience. He's been a champion for small states, and he's essentially written a book on small states. There's this text called Small Island Economy, Structure and Performance, the English-speaking Caribbean since in 1970. I'm going to remind you of that book, um, Dilao. And it has been one of the most highly cited um, books that he has written in his career, and it tackles many of the same issues that uh, we are still tackling today. It tackles issues in relation to stabilization policy, economic growth, tackles issues in relation to debt and balance of payments issues. So it's still a very timely and important book. Building on that um, older text, his most recent essay, Policies for Stabilization and Economic Growth in Very Small Open Economies, has become quite popular among academics. And it starts with what has become a mantra for Dr. Worrell over the last couple of years. I just want to read the opening um, paragraph or opening sentence because I think that might pop back up a little bit later on in the discussion section. So he says at the beginning of the essay, not in the middle, not at the end, the very beginning, small, very open economies are very different from large economies in that they face a, a foreign exchange constraint that cannot be alleviated by depreciation of the real exchange rate and, or other policies. The most accessible framework for such economies is an exchange rate anchor where the foreign currency market is, is balanced by managing aggregate demand through fiscal policy. Um, so that might come back up a little bit later on in the discussion section. Um, in addition to his research, Dr. Worrell's career has allowed him to gather experience on the issues facing small states, both within and outside of the Caribbean. He's the immediate past governor of the Central Bank of Barbados, having served from November 2009 until February 2017. Dr. Worrell, an economist, founded the research department of Central Bank of Barbados in 1973 and served with the bank until 1998 um, at the Central Bank, where he worked for 10 years. We sort of um, measure our um, vintage or quality based on our linkage to Dr. Worrell. So my, um, my mentor was Dr. Professor Roland Craigwell, who was also mentored by Dr. Uh, Delal Worrell. So I also have a link to Delal Worrell through Professor Craigwell. One of the things, uh, Dilan, I'm going to embarrass you a little bit. One of the things that um, Professor Craigle had a, a characteristic of doing is that he would leave on your desk some very small, finely written um, notes, written in red. He would do that on sticky notes, or he would do that all over your paper that you submitted for comments. And it was only after I questioned him why he did this, why he did this, why he did this, I realized that Dr. Worrell um, used to do a very similar thing. And he used to make it even worse. He would actually, rather than one sticky note, he would have like five or six sticky notes on your desk. Rather than using one piece of paper, like just five or six sticky notes. It was brilliant. Um, so based on his um, important work at the Central Bank of Barbados, he then went on to become an important member of the Bretton Woods Committee. And the Bretton Woods Committee on Network, I encourage you to look at the website. It's a really interesting website. It's a network of prominent global citizens which works to demonstrate the value of international cooperation and to foster strong, effective Bretton Woods institutions. He has held research fellowships at the Smithsonian Institute, the Peterson Institution, the Peterson Institute, sorry, the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, Yale University, Princeton University, and the University of the West Indies. 
He has been a consultant to uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Foundation for Development Cooperation in Brisbane, Australia, the United States Agency for International Development, the World Bank, the UN Economic and Social Council, the Caribbean Community Secretariat. Yes, and he's still married. Um, <laughs> he, he was the general chairperson um, of the International Symposium on Forecasting in 1997, a member of the Program Committee of the International Economic Association, Moscow Congress, 1992. Between 1998 and 2008, Dr. Warrell worked with the International Monetary Fund, focusing on monetary policy, financial stability, and stress testing in countries in Europe, Asia, Africa, and the Caribbean. More recently, Dr. Warrell was ser also served as the Executive Director of the Caribbean Center for Money and Finance. Dr. Royal holds a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of the West Indies and a PhD in the same discipline from McGill University. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourself for what I expect would be a very thought-provoking lecture, Dr. Dilal Warrell. Uh, thanks, Winston, for that marvelous introduction. Uh, Ambassador Yang, Your Excellency, the Ambassador of Japan, uh, Madam Principal, Dr. Song, distinguished guests and friends. This is uh, an especial honor and a privilege uh, for me. I am a proud graduate of the University of the West Indies, uh, and it gives me immense pleasure uh, to be tonight uh, to do this on the occasion of the 70th anniversary uh, of the uh, UWI. Also, uh, for reasons that I think you will discern by the end of this lecture, uh, I believe that this is going to be, and I hope that this will be, the first of a series of lectures which will be of prime importance in the calendar of the intellectual can calendar of Barbados for future years to come. As I say, uh, that's the, 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 the Confucius Institute lecture, I mean. Uh, and that is because, as, as I say, I think that you will see by the end of my lecture uh, why I believe that this to, be the, this to be the case. In April last year, my wife Monica and I installed a solar photovoltaic generating system at our home in St. Joseph, tied to the, to the Barbados light and power grid. We sell all the electricity we produce to BLNP, and we buy all the power we need from them, as we always have. At the end of the month, we usually have a small balance in our favor. We have power day and night, whether it's sunny or overcast, and our monthly electricity bill is zero. The price we paid for our system was about the same as our Toyota motor car. In effect, the price of a solar PV system in Barbados is now lower than the cost of the average new family car. That was not the case as recently as 10 years ago. What has made the difference is the entry of Chinese producers of solar PV panels into the international market, which rapidly increased production by several orders of magnitude. As everyone knows, if you produce on a massive scale, the cost of each unit you sell can be lower than for producers who have a smaller production capacity. Until Chinese producers entered the market, Germany was the main market for solar PV panels because the German government, along with some Scandinavian countries, provided generous tax relief and rebates to encourage the purchase of PV panels. With only the relatively small German market to depend on, production facilities were relatively small, and the price for panels was relatively high, putting the cost of a system for domestic use beyond the reach of people like myself. That all changed when the Chinese government made a major commitment to the expansion of solar 
PV generation as part of China's push to diversify the Chinese economy away from fossil fuels. This immediately created a vastly expanded demand for PV because of the enormous size of the Chinese market. That in turn was an incentive for Chinese companies to ramp up production on a massive scale with the resulting fall in the price of each unit. Here is an example of a virtuous economic cycle. China makes a decision mainly in the best interest of their own environment and economy to produce solar PV panels on a large scale. That reduces the selling prices of panels by so much that not only do Chinese consumers benefit, but many people in the rest of the world, including Barbados, are now able to afford a system which previously was beyond our means. This is a practical illustration of the benefits of trade between nations. And it also demonstrates how China benefits the Caribbean, along with all other countries in the international trading system, by making more affordable products widely available. The growth of Chinese industrial capacity has been a worldwide benefit. The most important event in the global economy in the 21st century has been the addition of 400 million Chinese industrial workers to the world's labor force. That is the implication of China's industrial revolution. Surprisingly, Western econo economies did not see the Chinese juggernaut coming. And economists in the West have been slow to recognize the full implications for the world economy, which are evident from the available indicators. Without China's manufacturing output over the last three decades, the world economy would now be much smaller, with fewer goods and services available to all. That has been of immense benefit to the Chinese workers who produce the, these goods. They have moved from lives of rural poverty to the security and promise of the middle class. Equally, it has been of great benefit to consumers in China and in the rest of the world because the goods and services produced have been exported to the rest of the world as well as consumed in China. The reason China has been so successful at exporting is that they are able to sell products that give better value for money than similar products from other sources. We buy Chinese products because our money goes further when we do. Americans, Europeans, and people from other large diversified economies should welcome Chinese exports to their countries for that reason. They can buy local motor cars, cell phones, and printing services, but they choose to buy Chinese products instead because that enables them to have a somewhat better lifestyle. Like Germany, Japan, and Korea in earlier decades, Chinese products at first had a dubious reputation. But with the maturing of their industrial processes, Chinese products can now hold their own in, in, on quality with the industrial world. The concern in the US, Europe, and elsewhere about the Chinese trade surplus is entirely misplaced. By importing cheaper Chinese products and services that are nowadays every bit as good as they produce at home, Americans and Europeans are improving their lifestyles. What is more, the money that China earns from its export surplus is mostly invested in the US and Europe, which is an additional potential benefit to these industrial countries. 
the demise of the sunset industries in rich countries and the attendant loss of jobs is the result of new technologies and slow growth of labor productivity in these industries, which means that their labor costs are way higher than those in emerging markets which use the same modern technology but pay much lower wages. Small countries like those in the Caribbean do not face the dilemma of favoring Chinese imports over local production because there are no local substitutes for the great majority of products we import from China. For our countries, the benefit of importing products and services of comparable quality from China in preference to more expensive sources is clear. The point to be made is that the greatest benefit to the Caribbean from Chinese economic growth comes from taking full advantage of the Chinese contribution to the global availability of goods and services. No action on the part of Caribbean governments is necessary. People of the region are availing themselves of the opportunities on their own initiative by importing from China and other affordable sources in Asia. As a result, there have been real gains in the quality of life and the access to goods and services throughout the region. China has been a catalyst in making the sun a practical natural resource. It used to be said that the islands of the Caribbean were poorly endowed with natural resources. Many people still think that to be true. But on the contrary, the Caribbean is richly endowed with resources which have been made valuable by the advance of technology. 50 years ago, the beaches, climate, natural beauty, and resort facilities of the Caribbean were not as valuable as they have now become because in the era before there was jet, commercial jet aircraft, the average middle income earner in North America and Europe could not afford an overseas vacation. Our natural resources were always there, but they could only be monetized on a relatively small scale because the cost of travel was prohibitive except for the very wealthy. Barbadians will be aware that tourism was a source of income for Barbados as early as the 18th century. Our earliest visitors, among them the very first American president and his older brother, came to Barbados literally for their health. However, up until the 1960s, only the very wealthy could afford a Caribbean vacation. Mr. Bill Malalu, proprietor of the Malalu Mortar Museum, tells a marvelous tale from the 1930s of a wealthy English family who brought their automobile with them on the ship from their home in the UK, registered it with, the, with Barbadian plates for the three months they remained in Barbados, and then shipped it back when they left, together with their chauffeur, by the way. The Boeing 707 changed the face of travel and tourism and made the natural qualities of Caribbean resorts the basis for a tourism industry which has become the most important source of growth for the region. In very similar fashion, the in very similar fashion, the affordable PV panel, which has become available thanks to China's entry into the world market as a leading producer, has converted the Caribbean's abundant sunshine into a usable natural resource. Every Caribbean country now has the possibility of replacing fossil fuels for all power needs 
using available, affordable technology. The sun, wind, or rivers and thermal springs have now become of immense value thanks to a number of new technological advances. These include more efficient wind turbines, computer programs and communications to permit thousands of small producers to join the national electric grid, cars, buses, and other transport run entirely on electricity, and storage systems to supply power when there is no wind or sunlight. China is already a game changer in one of these technologies by reducing the cost of PV to a level that makes it competitive with fossil fuels. And the Caribbean, along with the rest of the world, stands to reap immense benefit. The cost of wind turbines have moderated as well, thanks to Chinese output. Chinese production may also have a decisive impact on reducing the cost of battery storage systems, an area where Chinese companies, along with Elon Musk, the founder of the Tesla Motor Company and others, are making massive investments. The fact that practical, affordable technologies, which are currently on the market, can supply 100% of the power needs of the Caribbean from wind, the sun, and thermal sources has transformative potential for the Caribbean, which the region's leaders have yet to discern. Every Caribbean nation can now supply all the power it needs for the electric grid, for cars, cycles, buses, trucks, trains, construction equipment, cooking, and every other requirement from sources that are entirely free of cost and in infinite supply. In the words of the, date of the late Dr. Oliver Headley, the Caribbean's distinguished pioneer of solar photovoltaics, the sun will still shine when the oil runs out. And you don't have to pay to dig, it, dig or pump it out of the ground. The Caribbean needs to wake up to the fact that every day our countries receive more free energy from the sun and the wind than we could possibly need. Until very recently, we lacked the technologies to make practical use of that free energy. Now, all these are available and affordable. The transformative potential of renewable energy for Caribbean economies cannot be overestimated. If the Caribbean had no need to import fossil fuels, the foreign exchange saved could be used to invest in additional capacity to produce goods and services and grow our economies. Since we do produce some fossil fuels in the region, this output could be exported, adding to foreign earnings and growth potential. What is more, these additional resources of foreign exchange would be available each and every year. The growth rate of every country would rise to a higher level permanently. Growth rates of the order of 5% or more might become the norm. However, progress towards this goal will take place rapidly only if governments in the region catch the vision and develop strategies which provide incentives in the right direction. In the absence of government direction, the enormous potential of renewable energy for the Caribbean may not be realized at all. The underlying message in this section of my essay is that China has played a pivotal role in creating for the Caribbean and countries worldwide the potential for a 100% switch from fossil fuels to renewable sources of power. 
Caribbean governments can take advantage by instituting appropriate policies and incentives for the transformation entirely without reference to China. China has provided the world with a huge external economy in economic terms, and it is up to Caribbean leaders to take advantage. The importance of understanding China. My first visit to China in 1980 remains as one of the turning points of my entire life. China was then an alien country to Western eyes in very obvious ways. Everyone, women and men, high officials and street cleaners, dressed in the same drab olive green uniform of tunic and slacks. Only high officials had the use of motor cars, large, black, and old-fashioned. Rush hour in Beijing featured traffic jams of cyclists, bicyclists, maybe a dozen abreast on Beijing's wide boulevards following signals of policemen in elevated kiosks. Evidence of Western-style commerce was non-existent. Outside of major cities, one's fleeting glimpses were of rural lifestyles that were decidedly third world. What was it that hit me with the force of a life-changing revelation? It was the fact that these people, who have nothing of our culture, who share none of our beliefs, and have never been exposed to things we take for granted in our history and culture, are the majority of humankind. I have a National Geographic world map issued about a decade ago which identifies the typical human being, the group which has the largest number of individuals on our planet? The answer is, and you would never have guessed it, a 30-something-year-old male Han Chinese. When I first visited China in 1980, that country was a bit player on the global scene. My wake-up call was therefore personally enlightening, revelatory even. But you could have argued that, while it enriched my life, it mattered little to Barbados, the Caribbean, or the rest of the world. That is demonstrably not the case today. It is vitally important that we all get to know China better, and absolutely essential that our leaders in government and politics, society, the economy, and business, and our intellectual institutions get to know China intimately. China has taken its place in the forefront of global activity in every aspect of life. The countries, institutions, and individuals who under understand China and the Chinese best are those who will do well in a world which is being largely shaped by Chinese economic policy and the reaction of the rest of the world to that policy. The better we understand China and the greater our insight into the, 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 the dynamic relationship between the new resurgent China and the rest of the world, the better we will appreciate the opportunities that may offer themselves to us to take advantage of the new currents in world affairs. Let me offer a personal example. A paradox of our interconnected world is that it is very difficult to get reasonably unbiased opinions about any global issue, much less anything that has to do with a major event or issue affecting the interest of a leading industrial country. That is because the sources of global information, both in the formal and on the social media, originate in the West. We see this bias most dramatically whenever the Olympics roll around. Only in very recent times, when the Caribbean set up its own sports network, 
have we had full coverage of Caribbean athletes' performances at the Olympics? Previously, if you watched British sources, you would see Caribbean athletes only on the periphery of coverage that focused on British athletes. Similarly, US athletes were the focus of US coverage, Canadians of Canadian coverage, etc. We do not normally think about it, but this same bias is reflected in all the news we receive. In order to better understand reality, you have to have the benefit of several different points of view. Arguably, the most important development in global journalism in the past few years seems to have gone unnoticed in journalistic sources. It is the establishment of the China Global Television Network, CGTN, a global network with the resources, personnel, and systems to offer a truly alternative worldview. The closest we had previously to an alternative view was Al Jazeera, but they grew out of our familiar Western tradition and, as a result, show some Western biases. CGTN can truly live up to its slogan to see the difference because its roots are in a different culture altogether. What makes CGTN especially powerful, in my view, is its global structure with broadcast studios in Nairobi and Washington, D.C., as well as Beijing. As a result, the network offers the most insightful English language coverage of Africa and Latin America that is available to us in the Caribbean. Every morning at 6, Barbados time, CGTN airs a program entitled Africa Live, which is prepared and presented by the Nairobi studio. I have not found a more comprehensive program of Pan-African news anywhere, covering all aspects of African economy and society. In the evening Barbados time, CGTN's coverage shifts to the Washington DC studio, covering North and South America in a balanced way, which no other network can match. If you want to know what is really making news in Latin America, the CGTN program Americas Now is unparalleled in its coverage in the English language. Understanding China ensures that we are not blindsided by changes in the global economy and international relations. This is very important for small countries like those in the Caribbean because our economies are very sensitive to currents in world economies. Dramatic and far-reaching changes are taking place in the global economy and the relationship between nations. It is not at all clear where they will lead, but history may well record the current period as a watershed in the affairs of nations and peoples. Our countries need to be aware of the immensity of the changes because of their far-reaching consequences. I will mention just three examples of policies and events which have occurred in 2017, which it is essential that the Caribbean leadership make themselves aware of if they have not already done so. The first is President Xi Jinping's address to the world famous Davos Forum in January 2017. That conference came hard on the heels of the inauguration of an unpredictable isolationist Donald Trump as President of the United States of America. Trump has effectively abdicated American leadership of world affairs. At Davos last year, without saying so in so many words, President Xi took up that mantle. 
His speech committed China to an active engagement with the world economy and to policies that were the outcome of global agreements in the UN and its organizations. It was a tectonic shift in global perceptions, which was immediately recognized by many perceptive commentators. I am not sure how many Caribbean leaders and leaders of opinion locally would have noticed. My second example is China's Belt and Road Initiative. China has officially embarked on an external program of investment, infrastructure, transport, and communications, which is without precedent in recent history. It is loosely based on the idea of a modern reinterpretation of the historic Silk Road that linked Europe and East Asia. President Xi has broadened the concept to include land and sea connections that include rail, road, and marine infrastructure, and it covers countries in Africa and Latin America, as well as Europe and Asia. In effect, the Silk Road now goes by sea as well as by land and covers a network of tributaries and associated links. It has been said that if only one third of the projected activity takes place, China's economic reach would have broadened beyond recognition. What is more, investments that fall within the ambit of the Belt and Road are already underway or in place. The single gauge railway linking the Kenyan capital of Nairobi to the port of Mombasa began operations last year. It is of major economic benefit to Kenya, Uganda, and South Sudan. The third event which the world needs to take account of is the Congress of the Communist Party of China held in Beijing in November last year. At that Congress, President Xi presented a vision of a new China where the prosperity which the country has achieved is consolidated and shared with all Chinese, and where decisive action is taken to address environmental challenges in China and the world as a whole. President Xi committed China to an active role in world affairs, acting through the UN and its agencies as well as through institutions and cooperation agreements which China itself has initiated. At the Congress, the CPC fortified mechanisms for executing this grand strategy. President Xi's vision for China is breathtakingly ambitious. The risks are equally formidable as many Western commentators have observed. The difficulties of realizing such a comprehensive program, requiring full engagement of tens of millions of leaders in politics, society, and business, at many different levels of the Chinese administration and society, are enormous. The chances for things to go wrong are multitude. There is, however, an important reason to be optimistic. It is that, the, uh, that, underlying, that the, it is that underlying the entire strategy is a Chinese economy that is set to continue growing at a steady clip. A growing economy offers scope to ensure that there are no losers, and there is never a need to rob Peter to pay Paul. So long as the Chinese economy continues to be driven by investment in new productive capacity, there will, be, there will always be enough to ensure that everyone is better off. The key phrases of President Xi's discourse were the moderately prosperous economy and the initiatives to lift the last remaining 40 million Chinese out of poverty. Commerce and investment. Tourism is now the Caribbean's biggest export, so naturally, interest focuses on the potential demand from China. 
Here I would advise that we tread cautiously. Year before last, I read in China Daily, China's leading English language newspaper, a news item on the impact of Chinese visitors on Fiji in the Pacific. The sheer numbers of visitors from China have overwhelmed Fiji's tourist accommodations and attractions, and the visitor experience in Fiji has deteriorated as a result. Truthfully, the Caribbean still has so much untapped demand among middle and upper income groups in the Americas and Europe that there is no reason to devote resources to the Chinese market. Instead, the Caribbean should focus on discrete marketing to the very top end of the market in China to attract the discriminating visitor of considerable means. A similar logic applies to branded Caribbean luxuries, such as aged rum and Jamaican Blue Mountain coffee. Caribbean producers should eschew the popular market in favor of a strategy which targets the very wealthy. Chinese investment in the Caribbean is another topic which has excited much interest. The fact of the matter is that the Caribbean already attracts tremendous investor interest from countries and institutions that have always invested in our, in, in our region. The region is awash with proposals to invest in new tourist accommodation, infrastructure, telecommunications, business services, construction, and other areas that are seen as profitable. Investor interest comes from private international sources as well as from regional and international institutions. What slows and often chokes off investment altogether is the inefficiency of Caribbean bureaucracies. The Caribbean countries are now all in the lower rankings of the Global Competitiveness Report and the Doing Business Report. And most Caribbeans, Caribbean countries' external debt is now rated below investment grade. For many international investors, projects in the Caribbean that would otherwise have been profitable are no longer viable once risk premiums are factored in. Many other projects are hampered by delayed permissions, inconsistent incentive policies, and legal and administrative inefficiencies. My point is that there is no shortage of international investor interest in the Caribbean, and Chinese companies and official institutions are among the investors who are keen to take advantage of remunerative investments in our region. However, they face the same bureaucratic frustrations and inconsistencies as other investors. And as a result, we should not expect them to be any more successful than any other interested parties. One area with great potential for commerce with China is traded services other than tourism. These include legal, financial, marketing, design, communications, and administrative services. Companies that have a global reach make strategic choices as to the location both of their production facilities and of the services that support production and worldwide distribution. Caribbean countries boast regulatory systems that are kept on par with international guidance from the IMF World Bank, the Bank, Basel Committee, Committee on Bank Supervision, and other supervisory body, bodies. The region's financial systems are fully integrated into global financial markets through international hubs in London, New York, and elsewhere. These are key elements in attracting traded services to the Caribbean to support the activities of firms which produce and sell in many countries. Now that China has become the world's second largest economy, 
and the world's biggest market for automobiles and other items, there would seem to be a market for providing services to Western companies trading with China. This opportunity seems to be largely untapped. Another exciting possibility for future Caribbean-Chinese economic linkage is in the area of financial technology. I believe that recent breakthroughs in financial technology will revolutionize the way the world affects payments and settles transactions in directions that none of us have yet imagined. I have written a short article on this topic, which you may find on the website of the Bretton Woods Committee. Chinese firms and entrepreneurs are world leaders in new payment technologies. And the Caribbean boasts a wealth of tech-savvy young entrepreneurs with an interest in this area. One Barbadian company is doing pioneering work in financial technology. Regional regulators should be proactive in supporting and promoting these entrepreneurs as they can provide the Caribbean with greater presence in the international market of ideas. Inevitably, this will bring us closer to China and to Chinese approaches to the use of financial technology. How may the Caribbean maximize benefits from China's economic growth? The basic message of this essay is that the Caribbean benefits from China's economic success simply by following sound macroeconomic policies. The key elements of a sound macroeconomic strategy are policies to sustain external competitiveness and to maintain a balance of external payments with adequate foreign exchange reserves. The Caribbean, along with the rest of the world, benefits from the reduction in global inflation, which has come about as a result of the gro growth in China's production capacity. Sound policies ensure that countries reap full benefits. The Caribbean has an opportunity to accelerate a program to switch to renewable sources of power thanks to Chinese investment in solar PV and the coming surge in production of large-scale battery storage units. Caribbean countries have been slow to embrace the potential of renewable energy. Barbados is the only country to have announced a target of 100% renewables, and that vision is not yet reflected in a deliberate and internally consistent strategy. Here is an opportunity which, that is now open to the Caribbean, in large part due to Chinese commitment to combat climate change. It is up to the Caribbean to institute policies to take advantage. My third point is that the Caribbean should take full advantage of every avenue for getting to know China better. The establishment of Confucius Institutes in the region opens a major avenue for Caribbean people to deepen their knowledge of China and the Chinese. The Chinese Global Television Network is highly recommended. For those who do not have cable TV access, the CGTN programs are available online. There are many opportunities for cultural exchanges, education and training offered by Chinese national, state, and municipal authorities. Chinese embassies in the Caribbean are collaborating with Caribbean institutions and Chinese communities to bring Chinese culture to our region. Joint programs and collaborative research activities between Chinese and Caribbean academic institutions are other vehicles through which we can enlighten ourselves about the lives and worldviews of the world's most populous nation. And the principal alluded to some of the things that KFIL is doing that in, that in this direction. Forward-thinking Caribbean people are already on board and discovering new realities about our world from Chinese perspectives. Many who have done so are already benefiting. 
through access to Chinese products and services, networking, job opportunities, access to new technologies, and investment opportunities. Sadly, by and large, the region's leadership has not yet caught the vision. This, to my mind, is our most urgent need. Visionary leadership that takes a long view and invests in deepening their understanding of China's growing presence in our changing world. I have re had relatively little to say about trade and investment. There is really no need to. If you think about it, there is no shortage of funding for Caribbean projects that are seen to be profit profitable or for projects in infrastructure or renewable energy. So long as Caribbean countries maintain sound policies, Chinese investors will come knocking along with those from the Americas, Europe, and elsewhere. Equally, we can attract all the tourists we can accommodate and export all the competitive products we produce so long as we give value for money. Discriminating Chinese consumers will find our products and services through appropriate networks and high-end global marketing. My concluding remarks. Small open economies like those of the Caribbean are especially sensitive to the external environment in which they exist and with which they interact. As many small nations have demonstrated, this does not diminish their chances of prosperity compared to large countries. What makes the difference in countries, large and small, are policies tailored to the country's circumstances. In the case of small countries, external circumstances loom much larger than in larger countries. The emergence of China as a leading global powerhouse is the most significant international development of the 21st century. The Caribbean, along with the rest of the world, already reaps benefits from Chinese production and exports. With sound economic policies and strategies to accelerate the use of renewable energy, we can reap greater benefits. Furthermore, as we get to know China better, and Chinese investors and consumers learn more of the exceptional products, experiences, and investment opportunities the Caribbean offers, new opportunities will open up, further enhancing the region's growth potential. Thank you. All right, um, I'm sure everyone enjoyed that lecture just like how I did. Um, I have lots of notes here after that lecture. Um, what we're gonna do this evening is just take a couple questions um, for Dilal. Um, what I would encourage you to do, we have mics um, set up. So we could, um, you can get your questions together. Oh, we have someone roving around the room. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Doctor. Good evening, Dr. Rowe. You're hearing me, right? Because I can't hear myself. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, I'm not going to, uh, like Dr. Moore, claim connection with Dr. Worrell, although I could. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I am going to tell you that this has been a very, an enormously um, educational experience. I am very happy that I have gotten an opportunity to hear you behind the mic instead of your work in getting Barbadians to hear others behind the mic through the uh, lecture that the Central Bank gives every year in November, the Winston Scott Lecture. I'm extraordinarily pleased that you are behind the mic and able to talk to us. And I want, as a poet, to say this to ask you to consider this. The first thing that you started with that struck me was that 
policies commit, com, um, when you do policies that, um, when you create policies in your own interest, in the interest of your own people, your own self, that it's, it offers great advantage to how you move in the rest of the world. And I, I'm sitting there thinking it is very difficult for us to create policies in our own interests in the Caribbean because of our size. So this is your area. I came across, uh, just my final um, statement before I ask the question, I came across a, a, a saying by Confucius when I visited China in Hong Kong, China in 2007. Confucius says, one of the sayings, many, you love the sheep, I love the ceremony. You love the sheep, I love the ceremony. Now, if we are thinking of the ceremony being where you sacrifice the sheep, he's saying, I, you love the sheep, I love the ceremony. I love the sheep, I love the sheep dearly. And I am wanting to be more convinced that as small countries, we can make policy committed to our interests when faced by a juggernaut of the size of China where the woman who made these earrings for me yesterday told me she worked at the port in Bridgetown where they were told to take the labels off the cultural products that are Barbad saying Barbados, take the China label off. I want to, you to speak to that. Thank you. Okay. Um, could we have one more question before we turn it over to Dilau? I'll give you some time to gather your questions. I have one question for, for Dilal that maybe might uh, be related to that one. So throughout the entire, um, well, well, coming on to the end of the lecture, you noted the tremendous potential um, for Caribbean products to penetrate the Chinese market and for us to sell niche products to China. Um, what is so different about China relative to, say, North America or Latin America? There's always been this recommendation from Caribbean economists that if you can just grab a small portion of the North American market or the Latin American market, we could um, boost growth tremendously in the Caribbean. Why is it that we haven't been able to capture um, that small piece of the market in the United States or Latin America for our products, but you think that we can maybe capture that piece of the market in China? What is so different about those two markets? Okay, so, yeah. So first, uh, Margaret, you know, um, the reason we know that size is not a constraint is that you have some very small economies which are some of the richest nations in the world, okay? So the population of Iceland is about the same uh, size as the population of Barbados, right? And Iceland is number nine in the Human Development Index. The ninth, the, in terms of the quality of life, it is the country that ranks number nine in the whole world, right? Uh, and so let me give you an, uh, but the, the, so the, 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 the answer is that you have to have appropriate policies, right? You must not try to replicate the policies of rich countries. Let me give you an example which is close to my heart, food security. The way to have food security in Barbados is to have adequate foreign exchange reserves so that if there is a problem with the, with the supply of food, you can buy it from wherever it is available. You cannot have food security by producing your own food because, because of the size of the country and because of where our country sits, we cannot actually pro produce adequate numbers of staples, the staple foods that we eat and that guarantee the quality of our diet. We cannot produce them in Barbados. And, if we, and those that we can produce 
are expensive to produce. They're, the reason they're expensive to produce is because we are a relatively well-to-do country. And producing things in well-to-do countries is an expensive business. And that is why the products that we sell have to be targeted at relatively wealthy people. Okay, and that applies to our tourism, to everything we do. We benefit because as our, our, our own lifestyles improve, so there, uh, we, have a, we are now a middle class society. When I was, in, the day, in, 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 the, in 1945 when I was born, there was no middle class, okay? There was rich people and poor people. I was a, a product of the lower middle class and that, what that meant was that we had piped water in the yard. We didn't have electricity. Okay, so now we have transformed this economy and we have a middle class. And the middle cla class, and, the, uh, and uh, m many of, of the middle class, maybe of ours, can afford what to the Barbadian of the 1940s and 50s were luxuries. So there is a possibility for con local consumption of local uh, products, but it is not going to be the mass consumption. Mass consumption. So just to give you that as an example of appropriate policies. Uh, in response to, 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 to um, Winston's uh, comment, you know, in the Caribbean, we do not have a, pro a, a problem of demand. There are infinite number of people wanting to consume every uh, among uh, all the products that we can possibly produce, so long as we give value for money. The reason that Amman Hotel went out of business was because it was not giving value for money. It was, sell it was, it was the cheapest thing on the block. They had lots of bargains and so on, but people were not getting value for their money. And you know, that is the that's the, that's 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 the real answer. So you know, I'm saying that uh, we don't have to go out of our way to get uh, tourists from China. We will get discriminating tourists from everywhere in the world if we have resorts like uh, Sandy Lane. Uh, uh, and like Port Ferdinand, which get a reputation around the world. Because in those circles, people will want to come to those places and to have those experiences. And the, the beauty of the Caribbean is that, not only in Barbados, but everywhere in the Caribbean, there are unique experiences. There are experiences that you can only get, there's only one St. Nicholas Abbey. Um, Dr. World, that was a really inspiring lecture. My question tonight is, how do we get local firms to have enough vision or to see the potential that China holds in regards to increasing their bottom line? Dr. World, you've recommended that we can exploit potential demand in China to increase output in the Caribbean. So um, if there's a demand for juices, maybe we can fill that niche. But there is still the supply problem in the Caribbean. So what I am asking is what can we do to help local manufacturers, local businesses, to not only see the potential benefits, but to exploit any potential opportunities, you know, tackling the supply side. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, thanks um, a lot. Also, also um, my second question relates to the issues from the side of the government. Forgive me if I'm wrong, but I believe there's still a fundamental role for government to help companies in regards to exploiting these niche areas, not only in terms of market research, but also incentives that would be necessary for companies. So what do you see as government roles, as government's roles, sorry, in regards to helping companies exploit the potential opportunities in China? Okay, all right. Those two questions? Sure. Uh, so, um, uh, important questions, um, and the, on the first one, uh, it is important to understand that the problem in the Caribbean 
uh, is not with the firms. We have competitive firms, not every firm, but you know, the, 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 you know, the, 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 the beauty of, 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 of a market economy is that if you're not competitive, you go to business. The people that survive are the people who are competitive. And we have some exceptionally competitive uh, firms. We have entrepreneurs, rich, middle, and poor. And, 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 and old and young. So we have mature institutions. Uh, I'm not going to uh, begin any, sort, sort, not give, call any names, but we all know the names of the successful enterprises in Barbados uh, and in the Caribbean uh, that have been able to garner a world market. Okay, uh, and you know I spoke of, of, of our of our age rums and and and, and so on. Uh, so uh, those are more than sufficient to drive our economies. Their problem is relates to your second question, and that is the enabling environment and the support and facilities that the public sector needs to provide. And so, uh, you know, I always refer people to the Global Competitiveness Report put out by the World Economic Forum. Because uh, it is, I think, clearly the most comprehensive an uh, assessment of the things that drive investment and success uh, in the international market for countries around the world. And if you look at Barbados's uh, report, uh, the index for Barbados in that report, Barbados is still, there are only four countries in the Caribbean that are actually assessed in the report, and Barbados is still the most competitive of them with the one with the high, highest index. But Barbados has lost ground. It has slipped from number 47 in the global rankings, which was quite respectable, to number 72, which is not respectable. And the uh, analysis is broken down by different categories. There are things like institutional strength. There are the uh, macroeconomic indicators. Uh, there are indicators of the strength of your financial markets, your labor markets, your educational uh, and social services, technology, communications, all the things that go into the mix when investors are deciding where do they want to locate uh, their subsidiaries. And do you know the reason why we have slipped from 47 to 72? is because of two factors. One are macroeconomic indicators. The fiscal deficit that keeps growing. The mountain of debt. And it is bad debt, it is not good debt. There is good debt, good debt results in acquisition of assets. So you borrowed and you can see what you have borrowed for. We have borrowed just to keep the doors open. That is very bad debt. And that is debt that has cost, uh, that puts us in a very difficult economic situation today, unnecessarily so. And the second thing that has caused uh, the deterioration in, in our competitiveness is a declining confidence in the delivery of public services. So I urge all of you to go online, to download the Global Competitiveness Report. It's, you can download it for free and to uh, you know, sort of look at the analysis. And if uh, you, you, know, you want a quick assessment, uh, every month I put out an economic uh, letter on my uh, webpage, and I believe it's in August of last year. Uh, you have to check the, the actual number month. I don't remember exactly the month. But I did do an analysis of the Barbados report in which I highlighted the things that needed to be addressed. So our problem in Barbados has nothing to do with the private sector. On the basis of the private sector's competitiveness, the economy should have grown last year by about 3%. It didn't grow because investment was not, did not take place entirely because of problems related to public sector inefficiency. All right.
Could we take another round of questions, if there are any more? You have one right in the middle. Uh, good evening, Dr. Delacy. Yes, you know, like uh, two years ago, and uh, the China's, uh, Chinese leader and uh, Xi president uh, gave us a proposal that we called like, One Belt and One Road. And uh, what's your purpose of this uh, purpose? And you know that the, yes, uh, two years ago, China also built up the Asian infrastructure and the investment bank. And uh, you know that the brick country, all brick, brick country take part in this bank. And uh, yes, I want to know uh, whether Barbados has the attitude, attitude to become a member of this bank. Yes, and uh, two questions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next question, um, right across. If I may, uh, thank you very much for a very enlightening presentation, Dr. Waro. Um, you touched on one subject which uh, can be very important to uh, accelerate growth in the region, which is the uh, opportunity of uh, using renewable energy sources. Now, we all know the resources are very good. China helped us bring down the costs, so it's a bargain these days. And you said the leadership in the region is still slow picking that up. Why do you think are they so slow picking up on that opportunity which can actually increase growth rates by one, two, maybe three percent? Um, is there one more question before I pass it back to Dilau? Just one more at the front. No. Right, straight down at the front. Uh, yeah. Good evening. Good evening. Um, just taking up from the, the uh, question from the, uh, the previous person, precisely on the issue of um, the governments and the Caribbean government's position. Because to me, it seems throughout your presentation, I saw that there was a frustration with uh, the absence of a Caribbean government policy with respect to China. So I would like to know what exactly do you think, what more can the governments do? If you can expand on that. Because yes, we have governments who have taken decisions to establish missions in China, you have where they're working with, I mean, agreement to have the Confucius Institute so that they, they, they understand the need to have their citizens learn Chinese because presumably they understand the importance of China. I think you also mentioned the investment, the private sector can work in these areas. I mean, government is thinking about it, but you think, uh, it seems to th uh, get from you that you think it's still not enough. What precisely, or give us some ideas, uh, um, what governments can do, what more can they do in this regard, it's in respect of policy towards China? Thank Great. Thanks a lot. Um, Dilan? Okay. Um, so, in respect to uh, uh, the, uh, um, the Asian Inve uh, Inve Inve Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, uh, that is an important initiative, and also there is also the New Development Bank, which is the uh, so-called BRICS Bank, which uh, has also uh, uh, resulted from Chinese initiative. Both of these are, are vitally important uh, funding institutions. Uh, as far as I know, um, Barbados has not joined either at this, at this point in time. But I think that that is understandable because, as I said, uh, our problem at the moment is not a problem of finance. Uh, and you know, in the in the nature of things, uh, global banks of this of this uh, magnitude uh, initially are you know going to focus on larger countries. And, and since you know um, we have, as I as I intimated in my lecture, uh, more than adequate financing available to us for the things that we need to be doing in all areas, in infrastructure, in communications, in uh, whatever, uh, tourism, uh, whatever. Our problem really is not 
the availability of finance. It's not a lack of interest on the part, part of investors. Our problem, and also even in terms of affordable finance, so international institutions, regional institutions are willing and able. Our problem is the implementation. Our problem is the local capacity to get the permissions out, to get the, uh, the, the necessary approvals and so on, to get the licensing and so on. So that's, I think, the reason why there has not been uh, an initiative uh, uh, to move in that direction of joining the banks. Uh, but I think it will come in due course. Uh, but as I say, we've got to get the public sector uh, bureaucracy up to international standards uh, before we get there. Which brings me to the question of leadership. This is a crucial one. Uh, and, you know, you know it, it's, it, I can answer both questions together. Uh, and, you know, leadership is about having a vision. It is not about going through the motions. So much of what we do in the Caribbean, so much of, of, the, of the policies that we, you know, lack, convi lack, lack conviction. People do them because it is the right thing to do. They enter into agreements, or, and, and uh, CARICOM really, uh, my greatest disappointment with the CARICOM arrangements is that people enter into agreements which they really have no commitment to, and which they really don't really expect to achieve. You know, the CSME is, is the epitome of that. You know, the Caribbean has no uh, emotional commitment to a single market. They say that that is our ultimate goal, but it's not believable. And the same is true of everything we do. And I think that the only way that we can overcome that, that I can see that we can overcome that, is through the agency of things like this, lectures like this. And um, you know, those of us who have the vision and who have the conviction working as hard as we can and, get, and just keeping that message going. And we have got to have, you know, we have got to be realistic. You know, you can't get to, you know, utopia. You can never get to utopia, but you can't get to even achievable goals if just by putting them down on a piece of paper. You have got to have a strategy which is implementable, which you believe and which you can see is that you can actually do. And as soon as you uh, put that strategy in place, then you must take deliberate steps to measure your progress towards that goal. And we never do that. You know, for years we have had a strategy of bilingualism in our schools. And it goes nowhere. And that is the same thing that, that is the thing that, that, that is my, the source of my frustration. We say that we are committed to renewable energy. But then we do things that are inconsistent with that goal. We have no action plan for achieving that goal. It happens if it happens. And that is the, same, it is the same with our engagement with China. And so you have progress because committed individuals and committed institutions take whatever initiative they can. But it doesn't come together. And in the end, it is not durable because the top leadership does not have that vision. And we just have to keep working on it until leaders, real leaders, emerge in this, in this, in this region.
Thanks a lot, Dilo. I think that is a good point to end on. <laughs> I'm going to call on Dr. Song to give the closing remarks and the vote of thanks um, this evening. Senior lecturer in history and chair, Dr. Henderson Carter. Uh, Provost Chancellor and Principal, uh, the, the UEQ Hill Campus, Professor Yudin Baratu. Member, members of the diplomatic corps, Dr. Delay Woro and Mrs. Monica Woro. Campus registrar, the UE, Mr. Romeo Carter. Campus bursar, the UE, Mrs. Lisa Alin. Dean's immediate past co-director, uh, Confucius Institute, Ms. Francois Jackman, heads of department, specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good, good evening. Uh, my name is Song Qingbao. My Beijing name is Paul Song. <laughs> uh, so I'm the co-director of the Confucius Institute here in the QQL campus. It's for me a great honor to be making these brief remarks on behalf of the Confucius Institute. As many of you probably know, this institute is a joint, a joint venture between the UEQ Hill campus and the China University of Political Science and Law, for short, CUPL, or couple, in Beijing, China. This Confucius Institute has two main goals. One goal is to provide the Chinese classes on and off campus. On campus, we have free Chinese classes for students and staff. We also offer Chinese classes in several primary and secondary schools, as well as in some partner institutions, such as the Central Bank of Barbados and the Broadcast Corporation, a Caribbean Broadcast Corporation, and the Caribbean, Caribbean Examinings Council. The second goal is to act as a cultural bridge between China and Barbados and the Caribbean. In this context, we have undertaken many activities relevant, relevant to the domains, uh, to the like, culture, academia, and student exchanges. For example, the Chinese Bridge Competition, the Chinese Summer Camp, the Caribbean China Mood uh, Court Competition. Another e example is we have arranged the cooperation between the two publishing arms of both universities, the UE Press and the Couple Press. So we are hopeful soon the books of the Caribbean authors published by the UE Press will also be published in the Couple Press in Chinese. Thank you. But I hope all of you can read the Chinese translation published by the <laughs> Kapo Press in the very near future. Uh, tonight's inaugural Confucius Institute uh, forms part of our effort to build this cultural bridge, to enhance the mutual understanding, to encourage deeper thinking about the relations between the Caribbean and China. Dr. Woro has brilliantly demonstrated the mutually beneficial nature of the relations that is uh, rapidly uh, developing in the, in the Caribbean and the, in, the, in China. He has also clearly pointed to the keen certain areas where tremendous potential lie. My team and I, we are fully committed to, uh, to improving the mutual understandings with the support of the UEQ Hill campus and the couple in China. We are fully committed to facilitating to the flow of the ideas generated by the, such as the events like the lectures tonight. So ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Confucius Institute, I would like to offer uh, our sincere thanks to all of you who have made this lecture a resounding success. Dr. Dilaiworo, our lecturer, we thank you for having, deli deli for having delivered such an insightful analysis 
or the relations between the Caribbean and China. Professor Yudin Bartu provides chancellor principal of the uh, UEQ Health Campus. We thank you for your steadfast support of the Institute over the years. For Dr. Henderson Carter, Chair, 70th Anniversary Committee of the UEQ Campus, we applaud your great effort in arranging this lecture. For uh, Professor Winston Moore, the head of the Department of Economics, we applaud you for your wonderful introduction of Dr. Worrell. Mr. Francois Jackman, my former co-director, we thank you for your, we are grateful for your visionary leadership of the Institute. You know we are all miss you now. And we will miss you even more when you are in China. <laughs> for, for the staffs, thank, thank you, for the staffs, from the principal's office, from EBCCI, from EMS, from the security team, from the Confucius Institute, and all the others who have, who have made this uh, event possible. We thank you for your hard work. Last but not least, for the audience who taking your time out to attend our lecture, we thank all of you. I thank you. Thank you.